All right, we're live. Good morning, Sal. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Adrian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank you. Good morning, Adrian, and I'm glad to see Michael's on here so we can talk about the nuts and bolts of law enforcement, uh, criminal justice, which I always have a question about criminal justice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, it was cool. We wanted to bring Michael on because he has his book, The Mafia Cops, that he had wrote because he was a part of this whole case about these crooked mafia cops that were, you know, basically doing hits for Anthony Casso, helping him get information and, you know, a lot of other stuff that probably wasn't really even reported, I would think, too. I mean, there was a lot of stuff they may, they may have got away with. I don't know. I'm just seeing how deeply involved they were with Casso and stuff. But, you know, Michael has a really good background story. And so that's what we're going to well, today's topic is. Adrian, you hit it right on the head. We have we have um, we have since optioned again, friends of the family to uh, to a Hollywood group. And um, and since mm -hmm. that has happened. Uh, we have discovered a lot more stuff that they have done. And, um, and there's stuff that there's probably, we haven't even uncovered everything, you know, at this point, but, um, but you're correct. You hit it right on the head. So, wow. Uh, that, that to me is amazing because, you know, I left the life six months before Gotti whacked out Castellano, which was 85. And in those days, you know, there was only a few guys that were publicly, you know, recognized as informants or witnesses like Henry, Henry Hill. And, you know, my connections like between Gotti and the Columbos, I had two attorneys that were in bed with, with the Gotti before anybody knew who Gerald Schalgel was. He was my attorney in 75. And then I had Mike Corio, who I was giving money to in the 60s, who turned out to be a character. I mean... You couldn't write that stuff if you think there was this guy who was a great defense attorney, which he wasn't. He was a fixer. He could fix cases. So well, that's my background there. You know, you you know all about it. Uh, you know, Adrian, I just want to mention one thing. You said you started with uh, talking about my book, and the book is called Friends of the Family. And I don't want it to get confused with Mafia Cop, because that is the book that Eppolito wrote about himself which, as it turns out, was the downfall, was his downfall, because he put a picture in that book of him and Cara Kappa together in a squad room. And it was Betty Heidel, Jimmy Heidel's mother, who, after they had visited him, her looking for Jimmy years before, she found that picture and said, oh, man, that's what this is all about. And, um, and quite frankly, it wasn't until years later when Tommy Dade's was investigating Frankie Heidel's murder, Jimmy's brother. He got to know Betty Heidel, and she talked to him about, you know, about things. And then it wasn't until about 2003, 2004, when we started this, that Betty said to Tommy, you know, there's something I got to tell you. I haven't told you this before. But she tells him the story about how she found the picture of, uh, of, of Eppolito and Caracappa saw it and um, she had gone to the feds and told them, but the feds didn't listen. But she finally told Tommy and Tommy came back to me, came into, and that's how we start the book with him walking into my office saying, you interested in, you know, in doing this, the, this, this investigation. And we were off to the races. So did you work that case with just the state authority or the feds got involved with you? No, we we began Tommy Dades, myself, Joe Ponzi, and maybe one or two other detectives from the DA's office were involved in the case. We we had Tommy go over to the um, to to the federal uh, to the U.S. Attorney's office in the Eastern District and ask them for the files. They had so he returned with ten boxes covered with dust that they had that had been sitting in some warehouse. Yeah. And um, and started to go through it. We set him up in a room in the DA's office um, by himself, and he started to go through the the documents. And the break came when he discovered a computer printout that had been created by Epo uh, not Epolito by Caracappa. And what Caracappa was doing on behalf of Gas Pipe right. was to find a guy, um, uh, the the kid, one of the kids who was involved, one of the people who was involved in the attempted murder of, um, of, of Gas Pipe. And he he found that Epolito, I'm sorry, Car I keep yeah. saying Car 
I believe it's Kara Kappa, right. found the wrong Nicky Guido. Nicky Guido was his name. Oh, he found the Nicky Guido. It fit the description. It, he lived in, in Brooklyn, and it fit kind of where they thought the real Nicky Guido lived. And he gave the information to Gaspipe. Gaspipe then set up the murder of Nicky Guido. The wrong, the wrong, the wrong guy. Yeah. The kid, he was a kid who worked for the phone company, I believe. Could you imagine? And he was out showing his uncle his car. It was around Christmas. It was either Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. I forget. And um, and a car rolled up the block, stopped. Nicky saw it and, and kind of laid down over his uncle, who was an elderly guy, and he protected him, and Nicky got shot and killed. And it turns out that it was the, obviously the wrong Nicky Guido. Tommy yeah. found that 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 uh, that printout where uh, Caracappa, oh, which Caracappa ultimately sent the information to, to gas pipe, and um, and we knew at that point we were on the right track. We, we we and that really kind of propelled us in terms of the investigation. So when I hear when I hear that story, how reminiscent is it of Roy DeMeo who goes and tracks down somebody? He kills the wrong person. Yeah, yeah. He, he did the same thing yeah. with the, yep. another well, innocent college kid or something. Terrible, said, terrible, oh. terrible. Yeah. Hey, you know, we're not, <laughs> I hate to say this to you, Sal, because you were in the life, but uh, we're not dealing with geniuses here. You know, these <laughs> no. guys, uh, we're, we're talking about people who you, who don't think with their, with a, with the brain, if right. they have a brain, right. you know, right. and, um, and, and it was a, um, I mean, it was a tragedy. And, at, and again, as it turns out, that, murder was the key to the feds getting Kaplan, Bert Kaplan, to cooperate. And, wow. and I'll, I'll, tell yeah. you, if, I'll tell you a little bit about that story if you want to jump ahead. Yeah. But um, but this is what happened. So the feds, unbeknownst to me, I'm involved in the investigation with Tommy and with, with, um, with, uh, with Joe Ponzi and with our detectives. And Joe walks in one day, and now the feds had kind of become interested at this point. Suddenly we were uncovering things like like that uh printout and the fed started to they sent a they assigned an assistant u.s attorney they assigned they had one of their investigators and and they were they were participating in meetings with us but i didn't know until joe ponzi walked into my office another time one day and said you know they're putting this case into the grand jury i was shocked i couldn't believe it i said that what how come nobody told me well, they were putting the case into the grand jury, and um, and and what had happened is Joe had gone as part of the investigation, along with the federal investigator, uh, to interview Bert Kaplan. I think it was in Rikers, but I'm not 100 percent certain. He might have been where he was. He might have been in not in Rikers. I'm sorry, in in either the Manhattan, either Brooklyn House or, or wherever he was. He was he was staying at the time, or he was. Uh, living at the time. Um, so he started to talk to him about turning him, turning him. And the reason is we needed an inside guy. The investigation got to a point where we had hit kind of a brick wall. We needed someone. And, and let me just take a step back. What happened is I recognized that. And what I did was I called, I said, where's gas pipe? Gas pipe's doing 17 life sentences. Let's find out if gas pipe will cooperate. 17. So, yeah, he was doing 17 life sentences, plus on like 400 years. years on top of that. Wow. So I reach out, I find out where gas pipe is, and it so happens he's in Brooklyn. He's in the uh, he's in the detention center, the federal detention center in Sunset Park. And why is he there? He was brought in by the feds because a case was on trial and the defense in that case want was thinking about calling him as a witness so he was sitting there waiting to be called uh as as a witness in a defense case and so i say i call the u.s attorney's office and i speak to the head of the organized crime section who i knew very well he used to work with me uh and for me at the in the da's office and i said to him you know i want to talk to gas pipe they said basically are you fucking crazy yeah, no, we're not giving gas pipe any, any, you know, any play. What do you, what do you want? I said, listen, I want to talk to gas pipe. I've got, we're so far advanced in this investigation. And, um, and, and finally he kind of 
He said, yeah, you know, I'll uh, l- l- see what he says first. OK, so I reach out to his attorney and I get his attorney. He's, he's unfortunately deceased now. And, um, and, I, and who, who was his attorney? Him, I think he was D.B. Lewis was his name. I believe that was his name. Um, he, he calls. I call him and I speak to him and he says, I'll talk to my client. I said, no, no, no. I want to talk to your client. He says, no, I got to speak to him first before you, you, you can do it. So I had gotten, I, I said, he said to me, okay, uh, I'll go talk to him. And he goes to talk to him. And this is the answer I get. He'll talk to you, but he wants immunity for the, uh, for the Jimmy Heidel, the Jimmy Heidel murder. I said, are you serious? First of all, it was a Brooklyn homicide. I'll give him immunity. I, I'll give him immunity from the homicide. The lawyer says, no, 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 no. We want the feds to give him immunity as well. I said, right. your client is doing 17 life sentences, 465 years on top of it. You want immunity from the feds for this as well? Well, <laughs> how much more can they do to the guy? Yeah. He goes, that's my. That's what I'm. I want. I said, okay, I'll call. Call back to the U.S. Attorney's Office, speak to the same person. And he gives me the same answer. Are you crazy? I'm not giving that guy one single day off. Absolutely not. I'm not doing it. So I go back to the lawyer and tell him what he says. He says, gas pipe tells me, I- I'm sorry. He said, counsel, we're not interested. You know, you have to go uh, another way. Now, again, let me jump ahead, way ahead. I go to talk to gas pipe. In Butner, North Carolina, a jail, he was in a hospital, prison hospital. He asked to see me through um, Greg Gregory Scarpa, who, who was with <laughs> us on another case. Wow. So wow, Gregory man. walks, the first day Gregory comes into the DA's office, he says, you're Mike Vecchione, right? I said, yes. He said, I got a message from you from Gas Pipe. He wants to see you. I said, okay. So time passes. Time. I go to down to see Gas Pipe. Sit down with him. And, and I finally be, begin to talk. And I say to him, why didn't you want to talk to me? He said, Mr. Vecchione, I didn't know that that happened until I read your book. My lawyer never spoke to me. He never wow. came to me and asked. He said, if he had come to me, I would have cooperated. So anyway, so that's that's where we, we were with, uh, with Gas Pipe. So we were, we were kind of, again, looking for, back to the investigation, looking for that something that's going to break that through that brick wall we were hitting. The only other inside person that we could, we thought about was Kaplan. Third Kaplan, however, I was told is never going to cooperate is never going to give you any information. He's, he's never going to do anything like that. So it's a, it's, it's a dead end. The feds and Joe Ponzi for us went to see him. What do you got to lose, right? He may say yes for some reason. So right. they talk to him. They're in there. He's like, I'm never going to talk. And he says, if you force me, if you bring me in to do this, he said, I'm going to kill myself. If you put me in Rikers Island to wait for to wait for a test for me to testify, wow. I'm going to kill myself. So what are you going to do? That was the end of the interview. He gets up and he starts to walk out of the interview room. And Joe Ponzi says to him, what about that kid? What about that kid, Nikki Guido? How could you live with yourself? Oh, boy. That stopped Kaplan in his tracks. And he sat down and Joe said to him, you know what they did. You know what? what happened. And it's the wrong kid. That was a kid who had nothing to do with you guys. Mm. And you know what? That kind of broke, that broke the ice. And he had just become a grandfather. He was sick. And, but it was the Nikki Guido story that kind of put him over the top. That's when he agreed to testify and the feds then used him. And he was the star witness at the trial. Um, uh, Jimmy Breslin wrote a whole book about him in, uh, and his testimony, uh, at the, at the trial. So, so that's, you know, I know I was all over the place, but, but it was, so the things that were the key was the, was the, the printout that Tommy found. Um, and then ultimately gas pipe turning us down actually turned out to be 
something that led us to Kaplan, who was a way better witness, because as, as we found out when I talked to Gas Pipe, he never sat face to face with Eppolito and Cara Kappa. Huh. When he wanted <laughs> something done, wow. he did it through Kaplan. Yeah. Wow. So, yep, that's that's how it was done. And um and and you know, the uh, the the it, it was but it made sense because Gas Pipe was was concerned about putting himself out there. He had enough trouble. He, yeah. um, you know, he, he, and he, and you know, when he was interviewed by the feds, when he finally decided to cooperate in one of his 302s, he calls, he talks about that, but he doesn't use their name. He calls them. He says that they were my crystal ball. That's what he refers to them at, refer to them. And, um, and they were working for him for a long time. And it was Kaplan who was in jail with a guy. Um, and I had that name escapes me who actually told him. He was a Gambino guy who actually told him, Kaplan, about Eppolito and Cara Kappa because they were working for the Gambinos before they started working for the Lucchese, before they were started working for for, uh, for Gas Pipe. And, um, and, and Eppolito got, got PO'd, got pissed off with the, Gab, with the Gambinos because they killed a relative of his or a relative of his was killed. And that kind of soured him. So when Kaplan reached out to, um, to, to them, on behalf of uh, of Luke of of uh, gas pipe, they said, "Yeah, we're interested." Well, they went so, on the payroll. They, so they were. They were. So they gas were pipe, pay- gas pipe never met those two cops. Correct. Wow. Bert, Bert Kaplan was the middleman, and I think wow. that was his his. Uh, in the book, right. Michael, I believe you said that he was like that was like his card, or you know his uh, you know the, the, that he'd have one over him. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Gas pipe. Um, gas pipe was was very cool about that. He used um, he used uh, he used the you know, he used used Kaplan. You know, my interview with Gas Pipe was very enlightening. I tell you, tell you the truth. I I learned all about for, from firsthand knowledge all about the uh, you know the Frankie DeChico uh, killing where he the car was blown up thinking they were going to kill Gotti. He told right. me the whole story how it was yeah. planned. How he used the the munitions expert from, right. from the army that they knew, right. and um, and 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 what happened. In fact, you know, he gave us so much information. We began looking for the car. You know, the the car. What happens is the the munitions guy. And I don't want to say his name because he's still around, but he he put a bomb underneath this car that he thought Gotti was getting into. It was Frankie DeChico, and and they always. I always forget the name of the other person who was killed because Chico was connected to Gotti. Right. So that's the that was the famous, you know, the the mobster that was the famous mobster in terms of this killing. Right. So he puts he puts the the um the bomb underneath the car and he's across the street from the, from the where the car is. And and, and what remote. he does Yeah, no, but what but wait Sal, he he doesn't do it from across the street. This idiot goes, drives his car, makes a U-turn, drives next to the car that he's going to blow up, and then he presses the remote control. So his car was damaged as well. He was hurt, and he took off and drove away and then parked the car in some garage somewhere. Wow. Gas pipe, gas pipe was the guy who actually slipped the bomb underneath the car. He was walking. He pretended to be shopping, coming back from shopping, and he had a, he had a bag in his arm. And he had the device in the bag and he slowly walked past the car. And as he passed the car, he slipped the the bomb underneath the car and then went around the corner and watched and waited for the for the bomb to uh, to be exploded by by the the guy who had the detonator. So it was interesting. I I had you know, I knew all about this stuff, but I didn't know the details. And and he was very forthcoming with all of the details. So he gave he gave me those details that he personally Slipped the bomb under there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and hey, I yeah. want to say too, uh, anybody that's watching, if you got any questions for Michael or Sal, please comment them, and we'll get to them once we get to like. Uh, yeah, that, you know, that's that's amazing that you got to interview him. And um, I will Twice. tell you, yeah, I will tell you when I talk to, you know, I pulled off that case, the Judge Brennan case with McDonald, and McDonald went into Deary's office and said, oh, I want to use Polisi for a sting. He would be better than the Donnie Brasco case. And then 
the, the U.S. attorney at the time, Raymond Jerry, says, no, no, don't touch him. I'm taking him over. And that's how the case went to Raymond Deary. You know, I mean, you know what prosecutors do. They pick and choose. Well, of course. You, you, you know, one of the things that um, I, I, Gas Pipe was very forthcoming. And I spoke to him twice because he gave me information. Look, what he was looking for, uh, again, he was looking for help. He was looking for, for me to write a, uh, a letter a, a substantial cooperation letter to the government to, in a hope that at some point maybe they would he would be able to you know to to have his lawyer uh use it for some reason that's what he was looking for so i said listen you're gonna have to give me something i can't just write a letter based on you telling me what i already know it's in my wow. book so so he started to give me information about murders and um and i gotta tell you this little funny story it's funny to me. It's not so funny to the person who ultimately who was killed. But he gives me he gives me a, a a killing that he was involved in. He did, and he needed they needed to get rid of the body. And down on Court Street, down on the other side of Atlantic Avenue, which was, you know, it was Colombo territory. Right, it was right. uh, it was a mobster territory down there. That's Carol Carol Garden. Carol Gardens. Carol Gardens. And yeah. and they he 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 needed to get rid of his body. So there was this this location. It was a garage at the time, and they what they did was they broke up the floor, they put the body in the floor, in the floor, and then they they cement it over again. And he gives me the exact location. So I go down there because now <laughs> it's about to become an Italian restaurant. The front of the restaurant is on Court Street. Behind it, where this garage was was their storeroom now. They were putting all of their supplies and everything. And I say to the detective with me, I said, we can't tear this place up to get to look to see. But there was a body buried in that storeroom in this now very, very good, famous Italian restaurant down on down on Court Street. And that information came from, from Gas Pipe. He also told me about another murder. And I said, well, where's the weapon? He says, I'll tell you. We I threw it into Sheepshead Bay. Into the bay, which is in in the middle of the of, of the, where the stores are, there's the bay, and then there's houses on the other side, which is um, which is uh, um, it's uh, something beach. I forgot the name of, of the, the 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 community over there. So we told us exactly where it was and what the murder was, and it was a pretty interesting murder. I had not no not another. I had no choice. We sent divers into Sheepshead Bay and looked and looked. And Now, this is, I can't tell you how many years later. If that gun was in there, it had to have been sucked into the muck and, and we never found it. So I had to go back to Gas Pipe and tell him. I said, listen, what the information you gave me, no good. What else do you have? And he said, you know, I'll, 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 I'll get back to you. But he, he never did because he got, he got sick, uh, more yeah. sick than what he was. And uh, and ultimately he um, you know ultimately died. I think he died of cancer. He might have had um, prostate cancer. I think he died of COVID. COVID. He might have died of COVID. COVID. Oh really? Okay. But when oh, he was in, was Hunter, yeah, it was. Um, it, yeah, he died not that long ago. But he was really forthcoming in terms of, of the information to me. And um, did you ever I, dig I, up? Did you ever dig up the body in the restaurant? No, we never did. We couldn't <laughs> do it. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. First of all, you know. It came from gas pipe. I had not a single shred of corroborating evidence. I wasn't going to go give this guy a hard time and tear up his entire storeroom just to to find a body that might be there. I, you know, I, I I couldn't I couldn't do that. I got one other thing about the book. What I, so I, when I walk in to but to the the room where he was going to talk to us, it was me. It was uh, two other detectives. Um, Joe Ponzi and, and a guy named George Terra, who was a detective in the DA's office with us. And we, they brought gas pipe in, introduced us all around and he introduces Ponzi, introduces George. And then before the, the, the correction officer gets to me, he goes, I know who you are. He said, uh, there's a lot. And then he get, makes a joke. He said, there's a lot of guys in here with your, your name, your face on dart boards and they're throwing darts at your, at your face. I said, Okay, I, that's uh, you know a red badge of courage for me, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he he said. So I said, by the way, did you read my book? He goes, Yeah, I did. I said, So he goes, about ninety five percent accurate, about ninety five percent. I said, Well, I'll take that. You know, that's a, that was a good 
imprimatur from uh, from gas pipe, you know. Yeah. So, oh, and then insane. we sat down and he and he opened up and and the, but the, the, to me the most important thing this is why we went there relating to the mafia cops. I said to him before I left, before we leave, you have to tell me where Jimmy Heidel's body is. What did you do with it? Yeah. So he said, are you familiar with the Georgetown housing developments out in Georgetown, which is a section of Brooklyn? I said, yeah. He said, well, they were putting, beginning to build that. And, and it was a big open space that was going to be, they were going to put cement in to build the foundations for all these houses. And he said, and we had a guy who we knew who was who who ran the bulldozer was one of the guys that worked on the on the on the the, the, the construction <clears throat> brought the body there he bulldozed it into the ground and then it was covered over with cement and it's now under this tons and tons of cement in this section of Georgetown in Brooklyn at least Betty Heidel knows where her son is and we were able to tell tell her you know tell her that and um and it's not obviously doesn't bring her son back and it, it doesn't really help her, you know, her <coughs> what it gave her was some closure. And that was yeah. what I was. Right. Yeah. No. yeah, I realized how important closure was just this past week. You know, the girl Holloway, the girl that was murdered down in yeah. Aruba, her mom listened to this moron, this killer who killed the daughter. And then he yeah. admitted it finally. So she felt that she got some closure after 18 years. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you, I, I tell you, I, Sal and, and Adrian, I have done a lot of murder cases. I've tried a lot of murder cases at both on both sides. I was, a, I defended people and I prosecuted people. And when I, I did two stints in the DA's office, I, I started in 1973. I left in about 80 I came back in 92 when Joe Hines became the DA and, and I stayed there until I left. I retired in 2013. I picked up a case. It was a, a I was in charge of trials at one point and I had been in charge of homicide. Then I got promoted and was in charge of trials. And while I was chief of trials, there was an, a murder that occurred in, in Brooklyn in an old, the old neighborhood where I lived in, in uh, Prospect Heights. And it happened on a street called Park Place. And I lived around the corner. And I used to play ball on that street. <clears> all time. And I knew exactly where this young woman was killed. It was a young woman who had come from St. Louis to go to, she was in, I think in Columbia or NYU, getting her master's in social work. And she was working in a homeless uh, facility. Uh, I'm sorry, not a homeless, a, a facility for, um, for the domestic violence facility in the Bronx. So she lived on Park Place in, in Prospect Heights, which is in Brooklyn. And the Bronx obviously is north of Brooklyn. And she had to take the subway from the Bronx to her to the station that was on the corner of the block where she lived. And she did this one night and she went into a grocery store to, to buy some groceries before she went home. And on her way home, she was costed by three guys, wanted her purse, and she wouldn't give it up. And it turns out she was, it was a cold March night. And one of the, one of the guys took a huge knife and st stabbed her with it, put it right through her body from the back. It came out underneath her left breast. It became, and then they took off. What they got was a purse that had about $11 in it. Wow. Of, and, and what happened is at that point, the, or the next day when uh, they hit the papers, Giuliani was the mayor and Giuliani now made a big deal of it in terms of we're going to find who did this. Women all over the city were afraid because she was a she was doing nothing. She was walking down the block. It was a really cause celeb. So I heard this and I went to D.A. Hines and I said, listen, Joe, I, I, I grew up around that neighborhood and I know that block. When we catch this guy, I want the case. Now, it was not mine. It was the homicide. It would have gone to the homicide bureau. And he said, you know, OK, it took a year. I'm sitting at my desk one day and the chief of the homicide bureau comes in, a friend of mine, and he says, Mike, they, can, they think they made in, they got information about the Amy Watkins case. That was the name of the deceased. I said, what? I said, yeah, there's someone and they got an arrest. 
Let's go. So we went to the precinct. Now, I was going to try the case, so I couldn't take the statement at, from the guy, um, from the defendant. And, and Barry took the statement. And, um, and they, you know, they, they, we found him. We found who he was. He confessed, tried the case. And, um, and it was, you know, it was one of those things where, um, where you start to become a part of the life of the person who, who's dead. Her friends, all of her young female friends would, would come to court. And one day I meet a guy, an elderly guy. And he comes, he shakes my hand and, and he introduces himself. And it was her father. And he wow. and I became, I want to call it friends, but he, con he was in contact with me throughout our, the entire preparation of this case. When I convicted him and the second guy, but the first guy was the stabber. I walked out of the courtroom and Mr. Watkins was standing there. And he came up to me and he engulfed me in a hug. And he was crying and he said, I want to thank you. I know you can't bring you know, my daughter back, but you gave me closure. We now, her, me and her mother now know, you know, that the person who did this at least is going to, to pay the price. So when you talk about closure, it's a very, very important thing, Sal. And, um, and, and I have never, obviously, I told you that almost in, in detail, I've never forgotten that. I never will. I never will forget um, yeah. Mr. Watkins and what he did. And how did that, you know how that made me feel? I mean, I became a prosecutor for lots of reasons. But one of them was also to help the people who had been injured and who had nobody to help them. Right. And, um, and, and, and at that 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 hug and that's the you know what he said to me really has has stuck with me so so closure is an important thing and um and and it's um it's something that you know even wise guys uh think about and want at some yeah. point oh and uh so that yeah. was um my again back to gas pipe that was my uh I, those two sit downs that i had with him were um were so enlightening to me and and it was it was incredible, uh, really incredible. Well, I, I, I want to make a point, Michael. Uh, my entire life in and around the mob, and it started in 1965. My uncle had a hotel and a restaurant, and Sonny Franzese hung out there every night. And I met Sonny Franzese in '65. I got involved my entire life. I never once, I came close, but I never once thought about killing anybody. And then when the opportunity came to participate in a murder with Dominic Cataldo and Joe Messino, somehow the guy didn't show up. They didn't murder him that night. And I had dug a grave in Long Island. They sent me back to fill up the grave and I had blisters on my hands. But I never committed a murder, never participated. And for that, I felt blessed. They eventually killed that guy. And what turned me off for the mob was the killings over money, greed, and jealousy. Because as a young guy growing up, that wasn't supposed to be part of murder. Murder was to protect your, 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 you know, your wise guy buddies who you took a vow with or to protect your family. So fortunate, fortunately for me, I never participated in murder. Um, and as I looked back after I left the life, you know, I was proud to the fact that I realized what was happening in 74, 75, 76. They were murdering over money, over drug money. And that's what turned me off because the money was never my God anyway. Oh, I, I, last time I was with Adrian, we talked about another book that I did called Homicide is My Business. And the, 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 the central figure of that book was a a guy who was who was a hitman for the Bananos, and um, and he was a hitman in Sicily. Came over to the United States into Brooklyn. He was sent to Brooklyn because he wanted to be uh, made. He wanted to get made, and um, and he couldn't get it in Sicily. And at the time, Joe Bonanno and um, and Carmine Galante had set up this 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 whole pipeline of drugs. First, right. the French connection, right. and then later on, the pizza connection. And um, and and this guy was was doing murders uh, on behalf of the mob for 
all of the reasons you said and more, Sal. That's you know? Luigi, Luigi guy. Luigi, Luigi yeah. Roncesvalli. Yeah. Um, yeah, a a a, a guy. I mean, I tell you, Hollywood could not write a fictionalized character that would do justice to what Luigi was like. And he spent months with me, months wow. with me, talking to me and giving me information. And um, he was it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. You yeah. know, I, I got to give you another, if you have time, Adrian, I got to give you another uh, reason. Yeah, for, yeah go ahead. And then after that, then we'll go through and read these comments too after you did this one. Fine. I, I did a case once, again, with Tommy Dades. Tommy and I worked a lot together and Tommy and I were, have become, uh, you know, he's like my brother. We're, we're such great friends and we began working together way before we got to the Mafia Cops. Um, and we had this case involving a guy <clears throat> who um, who was killed by a um, by a, a I think it was a Colombo or a Gambino associate I forgot which family and um, and this guy was killed because he it, there was talk that the the mobster's sister was being manhandled by this guy it was being you know he was hitting her that she was in love with him and he was abusing her and. And she wouldn't tell her brother about this, but he found out. And he talked her and this particular defend, uh, deceased um, into trusting him. And she said, okay, you know, I understand you're in love with him. And, and let me help you out. I'm going to look for it to see if I can get a job for this guy. And he tells him that he has a job for him. He yeah. found a guy who would, who would, who would <clears throat> employ him. And, and he, was, he needed to go for an interview. And he said, I'll pick him up. And I'll drive him to the interview, and then I'll take him home. They were living out in Bushwick, on, on at, at you know at East in East New York, out that way. And um, and he said, I got to drive him. The, the location I'm taking him to is in Bensonhurst, and so we needed to drive use the Bell Parkway to drive. So the guy's all happy, he's all dressed up, and they put him in a car. He gets another guy to be the driver, and the plan was for them to fake that the car had tr had car trouble. The car that and and they and on the Bell Parkway, the driver says, oh, man, something's, I hear something. And he pulls off to the side, gets out of the car, to, and, to, and to kind of fool the, the intended victim and maybe the police or whoever would come by to see this car parked alongside the Bell Parkway in a very remote area at the time. He lifts the hood of the car and goes out. And now the, the guy who is the wise guy takes a gun out and, and forces the intended victim out of the car takes him into the woods, which is near where they parked the car, and he fires two shots. Now, the, our, the guy who was the driver became the informant for us, and he, he tells us, he says, I expect that. Get back in the car, close the hood, get back in, and, um, and nobody comes out of the woods. Not my buddy, the, the wise guy. Nobody, nothing. And I, I, I get curious. I start walking in and who comes out of the woods? But the guy who shot, he's got two bullet holes in his chest and he attacks the driver and he starts fighting with him. And while they're fighting, the wise guy comes out, comes back out of the woods, picks up a piece of wood and cracks him in the head with it, with it and finally breaks his, cracks his skull and he dies. Thanks. These two geniuses, remember before I said that the mob guys were not geniuses? Well, these two <laughs> geniuses forgot to bring a shovel. They knew they were going to kill this guy. They didn't bring a shovel. So they, what they did was they looked around, and it was in an area where it was kind of like a car graveyard. There were a lot of tires and all. So they bury him under some tires, say, we'll come back, dig a grave, put lie in, and then they forget, and they don't go back for weeks. They finally say, we got to go take care of that. They go back, lift up the tires, and that is maggots all over the body. And they say, forget this. They yeah. put the tires back on. And that was what was going to happen. Years later, they find out that there's going to be built on that site a shopping mall. So they say, man, we better go back and get that body and get it. When they finally go back, there's only bones. So they take the bones. They break up the body. They take the head, which is now on the attached to the spine, and they break it off. They take the skull, and the wise guy punches the teeth, punches the mouth to knock out the teeth so that they can't identify the. Put it in a bag, and they throw it into a creek that's oh nearby. God, how they many years? The, how many years went by, Michael? A couple of years, few years, and then a few years pass again, 
Well, what they did with the rest of the bones is they put them in big garbage bags and took them to Bensonhurst and dumped them in dumpsters all over Bensonhurst. A few years later, there's a guy fishing in that creek and he hooks the bag, opens it up and looks and sees a skull. He takes the skull out and throws it into the woods. He said, I had nothing to do with it. Somebody else was there and saw it, took the skull and reported it to the police. Now, that skull is never identified. It's buried in Potter's Field. And Tommy Dades gets from an, a federal uh, friend of his, this informant, who says, I know about a murder. And that's the murder he knew about. It. And it turns out that we, we do a lot of things. And Tommy comes up with the idea of we couldn't identify him, though. We, needed, we had some ideas to who he was. Tommy comes up with the idea of seeing if he had been if in prison. And um, and if he had dental work done, because what they didn't knock out were the back teeth. And sure enough, he did. And we took it to a took the skull to a forensic dentist. He identifies it, matches it up with the dental records we have. And we have a case. Unbelievable. Okay. Unbelievable. The, guy, the guy, the guy, the guy pleads guilty. And for, for the sentencing, I had a young assistant DA, female assistant DA working with me. And I said to her, Karen, why don't you just do the sentence? You know, well, you know what to say. It's just a sentence. And he's pled guilty. The sentence is already agreed to. <clears throat> she does it, right? About two or three weeks later, I get a call from George Terra, the detective who I was talking about before. He sets, I'm in the, working on another case. And he calls me and he says, Mike, somebody, this, somebody wants to kill you. I said, what? He said, there's a guy up here who tells me there's a contract out on your life. So you better come up and talk to him. He was an informant from the, from they brought him in from Rikers. And he said, he, so George says to him, tell this guy what you just told me. He said, well, there's a contract on some guy named Vecchione. I said, well, that's me. He said, well, there's a contract out on you. Who put the contract out? The wise guy who did the whole skull case. Not because we, we got him, not because he, he was going to jail. He wanted me dead. Because I had a young female assistant DA stand up and do the sentencing, and he felt disrespected. What the That's why they wanted to kill me. What the hell? I, that, I, the I had, ego. The ego of these guys. You know, when it. I testified, I had Michael, when I testified yeah. for Diane Jack alone in the Gotti, the first Gotti case, which I told the government that they were going to bribe a jury, she left. Right. And yeah. when I testified, she said, well, how do you describe the type of guys that you knew back in the life. I go, first of all, they weren't exactly 100 watt bulbs. <laughs> I mean, that's it. That's yeah. it. No. The guy, you know, we sent the wi we sent the informant back into, into prison, wired up. Tommy wired him. It was the summer. So he had to figure out a, a, way, a place to put the recording device. He had to put it in his underwear and, right. and his shorts. And he, and, it turns out that what happened is the guy ultimately after now I have bodyguards with me. I have all kinds of people. It's, it was unbelievable what my life was into at that point. And, um, and it turns out we find out that once the guy got sent upstate, he decided that killing a prosecutor wasn't good for his length in prison. So he did, he called off the hit. So that was, that was the, that was it. So, uh, oh, shit. Now, yeah. well, I mean, yep. it's, it's, but when I was doing now, let me just finish the story. When I was doing the mafia cops case, I was, I was living with my dad. I had been divorced. I was living with my father for a while and I had an office car and I went to the gym one morning and I put it back in the driveway. I come out after showering, shaving, ready to go to the office and the entire <clears throat> back window of the car is destroyed. I look up and down the block. There's no, no other cars like that. I drive it in. They, the detectives take it, they go to fix it. And I get a call once again from George Terra. He says, Mike, do you smoke? I said, what are you talking about? I said, I, I, what? He says, marijuana. Do you smoke marijuana? I said, no, why? He said, when they was put the window back in the car, in the ceiling of the car, right where the window meets the ceiling, they found a big bag of marijuana. Now, somebody planted it in. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah. And it was right when we were doing the mafia cops case. Wow. And we had kept it under wraps. We tried to keep it, but these guys were in Vegas. And I said, Tommy was the one that said to me, you know, somebody fucking planted that. And then oh, one yeah. more thing, 
right around the same time, I had this, my, my father's house was burglarized. They broke in everything. And I lived upstairs, the apartment upstairs. My apartment was completely destroyed. Everything I had was thrown out. Everything was, I, I had some cash around. It was stolen, all kinds of stuff. Every shield that I had from the various places I was in the DA's office, I was basically was stolen. My father's part, where my father was downstairs, nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing touched. Yeah. The basement where we, where we, where we, a common area, there was a toilet down there. You know what these, these, these guys did? They stuffed it with toilet paper and paper towels. And then they defecated in the bowl and flushed the toilet. So all of the feces and water went all over my father's basement. We had to get the entire basement Take all of the walls had to come down wow. every wow. in order to, to get this fixed. Damn. All during this this period. So what, uh, a, what yeah. a hell. You know, you were definitely a target after after a while. They really knew that you were involved with all that. That's yeah, insane. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I started there. Sal, you do you know a uh, restaurant Campagnola on the on the Upper East Side, First Avenue? I don't I don't remember that one. Okay. Well, I used to I used to spend a lot of time there. I, I loved the guys that, that hung out. I knew the bartender, and so I go up there and during the time I had the bodyguards. And for one, this night I had two female bodyguards, two detectives, and they sat outside. I went in, had a drink, and I'm sitting at the bar. And the owner, who I know, who I knew, he's deceased now, comes up to me. His name was Murray, and he says, "Mike, what's what's going on? Who are the two young ladies outside? And what's happening?" And I and I told him. And he said, because he wanted to bring them in, buy them a drink, et cetera. I, I told him that no, they won't come in. They have my bodyguards. And I tell him what happened. He says, um, you know, I know I know some people. He says, I can take care of this whole thing for you. You know how he knew them? You know who the owner of the place was? Was uh, the chin. Was Giganti. Oh, Giganti. He Damn. was the money man behind the whole thing. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I said, you know what, Murray? Ah, it's okay. No. I'll, I'll take care of it. It's I, I, I'm good. We're we're okay. Uh, yeah. So um, wow. So anyway, that was life as uh, you know the, the in the DA's office and chief of the rackets division. It was. Uh, did you did you happen to come across a homicide guy called Steve Kaplan? Was he a detective? In Queens, yeah. Queens, no, I I didn't do anything in Queens, uh, Sal. I was strictly Brooklyn, and um, I the only time I one of the only times I ever um, I ever had to work I worked with a guy who was not a Brooklyn detective was a, a Manhattan detective who actually was a wise guy case, and it was the first <laughs> one I ever did. And you know who the defendant was? Was Wild Bill Cotolo. Oh, oh, Wild shit, Bill yeah. and a guy named. Uh, George Tropiano, when Wild wow. Bill was not the Wild Bill that we we later became, they killed the guy because he was he stiffed them on uh, on on money that they owed him, and they stuffed them in a barrel, fifty five gallon drum, and they threw him in the East River. And they again geniuses, they didn't realize <laughs> that the body was going to come to the surface, and the <laughs> the, 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 the the gallon the fifty five gallon drum came to the surface, and it was hooked by a tow truck. Uh, I'm sorry, tow truck, a tugboat operator who towed it to Manhattan. The detective who caught the case realized that the guy who was dead was the brother of the head of security for the Brooklyn Union Gas Company and mm. lived in Brooklyn. And it was a Brooklyn case. And, uh, and, I, and I, I got it. And I tried the case 11 to 1 for conviction, the first trial. I thought I had made a big mistake in terms of selecting a juror. Guy who looked a lot like Sal, quite frankly, <laughs> came from came from Bensonhurst, and but he was had a great job anyway. I didn't I didn't bump him from the jury. As it turns out, years later, the the, the guy who represented Pitolo, the lawyer, became an informant. He was arrested for a drug case, became an informant. A guy named Marty Light. Oh, I and, remember Mar Marty Light. Okay, Marty yeah, Light. I remember him. So Light yeah. became an informant. And he, he he testifies in front of Congress, Reagan's Commission on Organized Crime, about right. mob lawyers. Yeah. And what does he tell us? How does he tell what the story he tells? The Cotolo story, and that they fixed the jury. That one holdout was somebody they had gotten to. And you know who it was? A young woman who was sitting, I'll never forget her, in seat number seven in the jury box, second row, the last person you would think would be and what happened was she lived 
uh, in the neighborhood, someone approached her and they, 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 they bribed her and she paid it. She held out, she held out. And, Man. um, it, and I, I, it, it actually not, didn't make me feel a lot better, but it made me feel somewhat better is that, you know, for 11 to one for conviction, I would have had this guy if yeah. it hadn't been for, uh, you know, what for, happened to, did they retry him? I tried it three times and each time the case got worse and worse. And worse. finally there was a, finally an acquittal at the, uh, the last, uh, the last trial. Two really? hung juries and an acquittal. Yeah. Wow. Sal, if you ever saw the witnesses that I had, the main witness was a guy who claimed to have been a driver in the Indianapolis 500. He claimed to have been this, that. He was a, he was a guy who was a hanger on and he told stories to everybody. And the defense attorneys were very good. I mean, it was Gus Newman was one of the defense attorneys who was an I excellent knew, attorney. I knew yeah. Newman, Newman, Ezeroff. I knew them. <laughs> yep, yep. And so, Sun and Shine. I knew those guys. Well, here, so let's get up. But you know something? One last piece of this, and I, I, I promise I'll stop. <laughs> um, when when Billy Catolo gets arrested by Tommy Dates, again, Tommy comes to me and he says, you know what he asked me about? He said, how's Becky Owen doing? Back? Is he still around? So he remembered. He said, "He almost, he, I almost got him. And it was almost. 11 to 1. So Billy Catolo's life would have changed a great deal if he had been convicted in that murder case. Wow. Back 19, that was 1980. No, 1976. Wow. I tried that. My son... My first son was just born. 76 is when I tried that case. Oh, so, anyway. boy. Go ahead, Adrian. I'm sorry to, to right. have interrupted, but uh, <laughs> we, got, we got good questions. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what we got. Anybody wants to ask Michael or Sal some questions or even me, just go ahead and start commenting. We're going to go through them now. <clears throat> so Leon was the first one this morning. He said, good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning, Leon. Uh, Tony says, hey, brother, how you doing, Adrian? Long time, no talk. Thanks for tuning in, Tony. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Leon also said, I was in Coleman USP prison, Florida from 2011 to 2016 with Stephen Caracappa. He jogged the track a lot. <laughs> oh, Leon. Well, you, know, yeah. you know, I got to tell you something about the two guys. What the, you know, everybody had the big mouth was Eppolito. Eppolito was a big mouth guy. You know, he writes even in his book how he would go back to domestic violence victims and and try to uh, to, to date them. And, and I mean, he was he was nuts when he was a. Uh, a, a uniform cop, and, and that's the way he was as a as a, uh, a detective as well. But you know who the most dangerous of the two was? Caracappa. Caracappa was the silent uh, and yeah. deadly. Oh, that cold. Uh, he, he sounded cold. He sounded cold. And and Caracappa is the guy who pulled the trigger to kill um, to kill the guy on the on on the side of the Bell Parkway. Um, wow. Oh. Uh, anyway, when, Wendy said, "Mike, did you know Tommy D. Simone?" No, I didn't. I didn't. Never ran across him. Um, Tim says, howdy from Kansas City. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, let's see. Gas Pipe and Tommy D. Simone. That's a matchup, he said. <laughs> oh, I, I really think that the more I've learned about Gas Pipe, I think he was the psychotic killer. And he was ob obsessed. Uh, when he had a hatred for Gotti and Angelo, he just wanted to kill them. And, you know, he, he sat with the Chigant, uh, Vincent Giganti, and that's how they blew up Frankie DeChico, who I was in jail with, and he was a gentleman. DeChico was a gentleman. Oh, who gets, who, gets a lot of, uh, who gets a lot of heat because they say he was the guy that was behind the DeChico, uh, that he killed DeChico, was, is, um, is Sammy Gravano. No, yeah. No, Gravano no. had nothing to do with that murder. No. Nothing. No. Nothing at all. Yeah, um, Leon says Lewis was at USP two uh, two cans shit two Tucson, Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whitey Bulger was there before he got to Coleman, Florida, and said Epolita Epolito used to harass Whitey Bulger about being a rat. Whitey used to say, "Go write another book." <laughs> <laughs> Epolito, oh my god. Yeah, uh, John says Tommy Dades cracks. Crack that case, yeah. It, I just told you that. He yeah. absolutely did. Let's see. He said the Brooklyn Federal D Detention Center uh, is in Sunset Park. Dade's ch childhood turf is also in Sunset Park. Yep. Uh, let's see. Pasquale says Herbie Irish. 
plate pate was the one who blew up the car what do you well, say I to that mike yeah. I, 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 he the your the, the questioner or the uh the listener is totally accurate i got that from the guy who hired pate to um to do it gas pipe hmm. let's see leon also says the wireless remote control detonator might have been out of range that's why he went up to get closer well maybe but he got too close he got right back <laughs> yeah. to the car that was right. that was a big mistake yeah. but um you know and they you know they had to hide his car his car was damaged they had to hide his car in a garage they hit it ultimately the feds found it and it was uh i i looked for it to see if we could find it when we were talking to uh when I, after gas pipe told me about it but we weren't uh we weren't lucky and get to get it we, we never got it you know uh let's see pete says roy de mayo and nino gaggi clipped epolito's uncle and cousin does you ever hear anything about that guys well i told you that um epolito was upset with the gambinos because they did they killed a relative of his and this must be the relative they're talking about which is why he didn't work for them anymore he went to work for the lucchese and he went to work for gas pipe yeah, yeah. Let's see. Sly guy says, yeah, I finally made a live. Thanks for tuning <laughs> in. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, this one's for Sal from Tim. He says, was Castle aligned with the chin against Gotti after Paul was killed? Uh, it appears that way. I was uh, far off in Never Never Land in Texas in the program, but it appears that Castle um, definitely, you know, lined up with Giganti because Giganti didn't like Gotti. I mean, there was a meeting when Chiganti sat down with John Gotti, and Gotti was bragging that his son was made. And if you look close, I think Chiganti said, gee, John, I'm sorry to hear that. He didn't recommend that we put our children in the life. <laughs> so the, the, the reason for the for the De Chico killing and the attempted murder on who they thought was going to be Gotti, Gas Pipe and Giganti were together because the commission was upset with Gotti for killing Castellano. That's yeah. the reason. And yeah. and 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 Gas Pipe told me that. So you know that was the uh, that's the reason why it happened. I got it from the horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah. straight to the source. Uh, Sal, this one's for you again. It said, "Did you have any dealings with the mafia cops?" Listen, I found a lot of cops that were corrupt, but not the mafia cops. Not those two guys. <laughs> I mean. Boy, they were vicious and they were animals when you think about it. I basically found cops who liked money. They weren't interested in violence. They were interested in selling their information because back in the day when I was paying off cops, there was no computers, no cameras. And whole that, different time. <laughs> yeah, whole different time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ronnie says, great show as always. Michael Vecchione is such a fantastic guest. Good work, guys. Thanks for tuning in, Ronnie. Thank you, Ronnie. Peter says, hello, all. Thanks for yeah. tuning in, Peter. Let's see. Um, I think Pasquale had a follow-up Michael for Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, how come Herbie Irish Pate never got pinched for Frankie mm -hmm. DiCicco's murder? First of all, Gas Pipe wasn't going to give it up immediately and, and didn't. And, um, and you needed more than Gas Pipe. You know, you couldn't put Gas Pipe on the stand. <laughs> And, and expect the jury with his background to, to buy everything he said. So right. you need corroboration. And, um, and, and there really wasn't <clears throat> any corroboration. Believe me, I really toyed with the idea of, of locking up Pate after I had spoken to Gas Pipe. And, and I had information, but I didn't have enough. And Gas Pipe wasn't going to, wasn't going to be enough to, uh, to convince a Brooklyn jury. That's, that's essentially it. Yeah. Uh, let's see CJC says, Mike is a great speaker. He makes his stories come to life when he speaks and when he writes about them. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I thank agree you. with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. Let me go. To oh, for Sal. Look, who, look who's in today. Joey Bubbles. Oh, Bubbles. <laughs> hey, Joey Bubbles. He said, morning, fellas. Love today's show. Really good outstanding. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm working with Bubbles to create a script. He's a, a producer. Uh, we're going to try to tell this story about 
who the guys were that were in Lewisburg and what happened to them and how much of an impact those guys had on generally the demise of the mob 10 or 15 years later. So, hey, Bubbles, who do you, who do you like today in football? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I'll go ahead, Mark. That doesn't work. If that doesn't work out, that script, you can always go back to Homicide is My Business. Luigi yeah. Ronsky's Bali is... Is is a is a character that some way I'm going to get on the screen. He's a terrific, a terrific character. I think what's so his, too. What's his name again, Michael? Luigi Roncis Valia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Luigi guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a really good story. Uh, sports card Yankee said Adrian and Sal getting some fire check-ins, which means good guess, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find the next question. Kind of a little back and forth going on in the chat. Let's see. Randy says, were there any mobsters that were afraid of? Uh, I guess you kind of maybe got cut, were cut afraid off. Of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and maybe you, Mike. I don't know if you were afraid of any mob guys. I have to tell you, I really wasn't. I, I wasn't. I, um, you know, I, I lived around the corner. From uh, I lived in Carroll Gardens uh, for a, a good period of time, and I lived around the corner from two social clubs. And um, and the guys that were there knew who I was, and they would be outside, and I'd pass by, I'd be on a way to get a slice of pizza or something. And um, it was always, um, "Hey, counselor, how are you? You know, how you doing? That kind of thing." And um, <laughs> you know, they they it, it was just not that way. And a guy across the street from me lived. He lived. He one day introduced himself, wanted me to know who he was and, and said, I know who you are. And, uh, you know, welcome to the block kind of thing. So <laughs> I, I, I wasn't. I, I, can I tell you one little quick thing? Yeah, I, sure. I parked my car one night on I lived on Sackett Street at that time in, in Carroll Gardens. And I and I parked my car and I'm walking down the block and it was about 11 o'clock. It was dark and I'm, and I'm coming back from the office and I had my briefcase with me. And I noticed that at the corner of my eye across the street. A guy starting to walk along with me and then diagonally crosses the street and was going to come right to where my my house was, my apartment building. And I and I meet at the same time. And I said to myself, uh, here we go. What do I, all I have is my briefcase. I didn't know what was going to happen. And he says to me, counselor, how are you? And I said, yeah, who are you? And he says, I'm your neighbor. So whatever his name was across the street, I'm a correction officer. I had a guy in, in, he was guard in Rikers Island. And he said, when are you going to get that guy? So-and-so out of my hair, because he's a pain in the ass in the, and he was waiting to be sentenced. And I said, soon, soon, don't worry about it. Well, that was, that was the only time I of all the times I was ever afraid. And even when I had to hit uh, put out and all of that other stuff was going on. I was dating someone at the time who was an assistant DA in Manhattan. And she said to me, what is going on? Who are all these people with us all the time? When we go? And I told her the story. And I, she said, I, aren't you, aren't you concerned? I said, no, nah, really I'm not. She said, you're crazy. You're crazy. I, I would be concerned and, and don't ever send them away. If you're with me, make sure that they're here with us all the time. <laughs> so, but I, I can't, the answer is no, I was never, I really wasn't ever afraid. Okay. Yeah, good, good, good response. Michael joined in. He said, "Good morning, boys. Thanks for tuning good in." Morning. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. He said he loves your cap, Sal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> NY. <laughs> uh, another question for Sal. He said, "Did you know Pete the Pick?" No, I didn't know the Pete the Pick guy. There was a lot of Pete's, but I didn't know that one. <laughs> what about you, Michael? You know anything about that guy? No, no. I have to a little more information than that, but I don't know that guy. <laughs> Uh, this was what I was going to bring up too. Tim brought it up. He said, "What did wise guys think of Epolito playing Fat Andy in Goodfellas?" That tripped me out. I seen that man. What, what did you guys think about that? Maybe you should ask Anthony. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> did you see that, Mike? I think you had that in the book about Epolito being the Fat Andy in that movie. Yeah, well, you know, Epolito was when he went to Las Vegas. He wanted to become a uh, you know a movie star. He was that's. What he, you know, what he did, and in, and and in order to do that, to get his scripts handled and to get more, he he he, what he did was he was supplying a guy who turned out to be a DEA informant who he thought was a producer out there, and he was giving him drugs. He was he, and that was what that allowed the feds to say that the RICO statute applied because the Epolito Caracappa 
organized crime group was still in existence and working. And that's how the feds were able to get that RICO um, conviction because of the drug dealing that they were doing. And that was Epolito's, his, um, you know, his ego out there. Mm -hmm. And he was, he said, you know, they said, is a big producer coming to town? Can you supply some drugs? <laughs> and the guy who was putting it all, all of that together turned out to be an informant. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, he had, Michael said that Pete, the pick was from the Mayo crew actually. Okay. So I, I, yeah, I don't know if that rings any more bills. Okay. Let's see. The next one I had was Pasquale had a follow up on Herbie. He said he died from COVID in 2022. Oh, I wow. didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay. Wow. Well, if I had known that, I would have given you his name when I told you the story the first time. But <laughs> Herbie Pate was, he had been a de demolition expert in the, in the army. And that's why gas pipe got him to put the, to create the, uh, the, the, the bomb that they put under the car. Yeah. Do you, so Brian asked, is the mafia still around? And Michael, <laughs> Michael, you might be able to elaborate yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. The answer is a big Y E S. Of course it is. Absolutely. It's uh, it may be in a different shape and different form and, right. and, and the guys in it act differently, somewhat differently, but it's still around. And, um, and, and I think will be when all of us are gone, to quite frankly. Um, yeah. So the answer is yes. Uh, Tim said, "This show kicks ass. I love <laughs> it. I love it. It's great. Truly seeing history come to life. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you get this one, Sal, but it's Michael says, Sal, just tell me you never chopped a, a Buick. <laughs> well, the truth was, you know, Buicks weren't in demand. It was Monte Carlos, T-Birds, Chevys." Uh, occasionally we did a Buick, but uh, they weren't a big demand. I think uh, when I was doing cars, Cadillacs, the Vils were, were the end thing. Yeah. So you didn't chop up the Buick then? Uh, Not no. too many Buicks, no. There's your answer, Michael. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sal, when you were on the streets, did you know about oh, the mafia cops? No, you said you didn't. This was after your time, I believe, right? No, I didn't know those two guys. Uh, like I said, I knew corrupt cops, but not those two. I think they were, you know, they were the most, you know, soiled police officers ever. And I think Michael might know, didn't the government pay family $17 million or something, Michael? Of course, uh, there was some sort of a, a payment, yes. Wow. Yeah. It come from the feds. It didn't come from us. Right. Because the feds. feds were the ones who tried the case, yeah. Right. right. Let's see. Michael has says, is it true Anthony Center is going to get out in June of 2024? This is what I keep getting, like, uh, comments on a lot of the videos that we've done, sound like about Roy DeMeo and stuff. So people must be looking into him, and that seems to be what you can go on. You can go on the BOP, and if you know his uh, most accurate age, you can find out his date of release. And maybe that's, that's true. true. I don't know. I thought he got life. I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know a lot of people are commenting that on most of our recent videos, so that might be the case then. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. I don't want to butcher that name, Sal, so you read that question. <laughs> did, did Mike ever work with Pete LaFrocia on the Castellano tapes case? Interesting. Didn't work the Castellano tapes case. That was... Um... That was the if the, if what I'm he's right if what I believe he's talking about turned out to be the uh, the commission case right put, um, that was Giuliani and um, and the feds in the Southern District it was not not us and it was before before me no. well no not it was I, I never worked in the feds but it was um, it was not me it was uh, that was Giuliani my. Um, my guy Luigi testified for Giuliani, but not in this case. He testified in a pizza connection case. Uh, so I'm not sure. I No, I was not working on this. I never worked on the Castellano case. Let's see. Uh, Leon says, Stephen Car Caracappa almost ran into me literally on the track. That's when a guy let me know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim says, Michael, was gas pipe threatening at, at all when you were talking with him? In the slightest, not in the least. He yeah. was, um, he was a. If you if you can say this about a guy like him, a murderer like him, he was a gentleman to us when we when we talked to him. Um, 
and um, no, he was he was not threatening at all. Not threatening. I, I think I think people should know guys like Gas Pipe, guys like DeMeo, guys like Gotti. They had a certain flair of a personality, and they were chameleons. They could act one way with. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one way and then another way with criminals. I mean, so they were really good actors, those guys. Yeah. Uh, let's see. They said, uh, I had a 84 Buick <laughs> Century Turbo Coupe ugly car, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing about that car was, well, 84 was a little later, but you know, really they had big trunks. You could put a few bodies in those yeah. cars. <laughs> uh let's see ronnie said did you watch on sally jesse raphael raphael you, no. you know what that is that's that's how betty heidel recognized um recognized oh. them put it all together they epolito was was touting his book Ma uh, mafia cop and she went out and bought it and she looked in the middle where the pictures were and saw the picture that he put in of he and Kara Kappa together in the squad room. Jeez. And um, and that's how she put, she then recognized them as coming to her door looking for her son. Could you so imagine? They, you know, they picked up Frankie thinking he was Jimmy and had to let him go. And when he came home, he said, he told his mother about it. And she said, well, they were here. And, um, you know, and and they, they did find uh, Jimmy that day. They picked him up in Brooklyn. They found out that he was in Brooklyn and they conned them into their car they were off duty, but they had a car that looked like a police car, like a, a, a you know, a Crown Vic or one of those cars that they were okay. using back then. And um, and then they they forced them into the car, brought them into um, uh, they tied them up and they brought them to a. Um, were you familiar with King's Plaza, Sal, in uh, yeah. Brooklyn? Sure. Okay, so behind King's Plaza was a Toys R Us and they brought him into that parking lot and they transferred him from their car to the wise guy car. And then they brought the wise guys brought him to Gas Pipe, who was in a, had a house. He was in a basement of a house that was owned by another wise guy. And that's where they tortured him. And he gave him the information about who was involved in the shooting. Gas is Pipe that, shooting. Is that when uh, Gas Pipe tortured him like for 10 hours? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We went. So when we got the information, we went to um, we went to that house. We found it. And um, and Tommy gets. Uh, goes down to the basement along with people who were going to look for blood, etc. And, and he calls me and he says, Mike, this entire, first of all, the house was resold. The entire basement was mirrored. There were mirrors everywhere, everywhere. And the floor was brand new. He said, there's no way that we would have to destroy this house in order for us to, um, you know, to find anything. And we, we had to give it up. We couldn't, we couldn't do it. So, mm -hmm. but we did find the house. We did find the house. Yeah. Uh, Michael said, love your show. Please keep them coming. Absolutely, Michael. Thank you. Uh, you know, t tomorrow night, Michael, there's going to be a, a premiere of a Netflix show. Do you know about it? What's the, what is it? What's the name? I'm... The name is Get Gotti. No, but, I didn't know that. What yeah, I'll be, I'll be on there. But it's oh, tomorrow okay. night, Netflix is doing a, five or six part series about the making of a mob boss. So tomorrow night they'll uh, show the first episode. Wow. I didn't, I hadn't even seen it advertised. Uh, yeah. I look, okay. I'll check it out. Yeah. They're going to have uh, Ruggiano's on it too. I mean, those were Sal and him were for sure in it, but I don't know. I don't know who out the trailer showed probably law enforcement yeah. and stuff too. I'd imagine. Yeah. That. Oh, that's great. So that's it should great. be pretty cool. They're, they're doing a different POV, Michael. They're doing something like, okay, let's do it more from the street side because right. they, did, they did do this Fear City a couple of years ago, and I think that the public uh, was a little bored with it for some reason. And now they're doing it from you know the organized crime point of view. Okay, I got to take, yeah. I got to watch it, obviously. So, yeah. <laughs> Jacqueline, said, oh, she said, "Good morning, guys. I'm from Brownsville, East New York area. Every day, a body or two was found in the old." Garbage dump near Kennedy Airport. Those guys were very busy. Thanks yeah. for a great show. You sure. know that's that's the Fountain Avenue dump, Michael. Yeah, yeah, that's where the they bring the cars, the uh, the abandoned cars, stolen cars. Yeah, that was it. Yep. I, I know. Yeah, I did business with the Coniglias. 
and they had that Fountain Avenue dump only like a mile or two miles from their Fountain Auto Parts the junkyard. And there Charles go. Charles was a sicko. Well, you know that it really kind of puts uh, more truth to the fact that we when when those two guys went out and buried that body and they couldn't find they didn't have a shovel that they used tires. You know the right. the old tires. You know that 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 uh, that that. that Shopping mall actually got built. I've been to it many times, and every time I go there, it's a it's unbelievable. I say to myself, "Boy, oh boy, what a story is that's attached to this." And yeah. I'm sure nobody at that shopping mall wants that story to come out. It's uh, no. but it's it's absolutely true. So yeah. yeah, no, I mean we're probably almost at a good wrapping point too. So I mean, if uh, what what I'll say too is that uh, so Sal, I mean you could talk about it a little bit you know we, we're gonna start like this you know kind of go fund me page for the, getting your movie slash screenplay going on uh, yeah about the mafia row the guys you were in prison with on the lewisburg so once that's up we'll, we'll put a link in there and if anybody wants to make donations and stuff yeah. they can. But it's just good information i think the, the public should understand what happened you know in the 70s and how progressively the demise of the mob was taking place and who really initiated it. And it was really Angelo, I, unbeknownst to the public, Willie Boy Johnson kept giving information and he really despised Angelo. So uh, he wouldn't talk too much about Gotti as much as he did about Angelo. He, he really had a, uh, a terrible feeling about Angelo. So what happened was through the years, Progressively, Angelo just became like a speaker, and the government got all that information. And ironically, it led to Castellano wanting to kill Angelo and John. Of course, the rest we all know. But how did it begin? And I think that's what I'm interested in sharing is and who was Joe Armone? Who was Joe Piney? You know, when you think back, who was Joe Piney in the 40s or the 50s? And how did he become? you know, the underboss for Gotti. Well, it was all about a timing, a whole timing period there of the 80s. Yeah, I think guys. Joe Piney owned a, a a bakery on, um, I think it was First Avenue in Manhattan. Um, take a few steps down around 11th Street, 10th Street. I used to, the right. place I used to go to, I didn't even know that until much later, I, but I used to go in there because that was an Italian restaurant over there that I used to go <laughs> right. to Lanza's all the time. Yeah, and, Lanza's, um, yeah, popular. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, he was the shriveled up little guy in prison. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the people that were there when I was fortunate, fortunate enough to uh, play chess with Chicken Phil Testa and Harry Riccobini from Philadelphia. I mean, Michael Franzese and I went to Philadelphia all 10 years ago when National Geographic did the making of the mob. But I met all these guys, and they had a certain chemistry about them in the 70s. And, of course, they were the old timers. And once mm -hmm. the new guys came in, Michael, everything changed with all the new guys. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, and if you guys want to get Michael's book, Mafia Cops, that'll be in the video description. Oh, I got no. that. Adrian, the name of the book is Friends of the Family. Oh, yeah, my bad. My bad. Mafia Cop is, is Eppolito's book, <laughs> yeah. Friends of the Family, yeah. Okay. And, um, and Homicide is My Business is about Luigi Ronces Folly. So yeah. and if, if you would give me a second, I really would like no. to plug my, my two novels. I started yeah. writing novels after I did Homicide is My Business. They're both, the, the first one is called uh, Fallen Angel, a true crime fantasy. And the second book just came out. It's called uh, Fallen Angel, book two, the War for the Soul of Brooklyn. And basically what it is, uh, all of the crimes that you read about in, that, in those novels are all cases that I did. And the, the premise is that Satan has come to Brooklyn and <laughs> Satan and a prosecutor is, is selected to, to do battle with, uh, with the evil one. And that's, that's what those two books are about. But every one of the cases um, that you read about or the, the crimes that I have now Satan instigating uh, were inst were were committed by people who were not attached to Satan. Although, quite frankly, they may very well have been. That's how bad they were. But the bottom line is uh, that's the that's the uh, the premise of the book, Fallen Angel one and two. And I'm writing three right now. So well, great. I'm glad to have met you. I'm sure I'll get your contact. We'll talk because you also, like my friend McDonald, 
you're a wealth of information and resource. And Thank you. I enjoy, I enjoy talking to the right side of the law because 39 years ago I left the other side. Yep. And it's been fun. It's been fun for me. Thank you. And it's been fun to, to, uh, to talk to you guys. And, and it's nice to meet you, Sal. And Adrian, it's always, uh, always a pleasure. So um, yeah. you know how to reach me. If you ever want me again, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, if anybody hasn't seen mine and Michael's show we've done, it's on my channel. You can go watch it. it it's the whole in-depth story about Michael's book that he wrote about Luigi Roncesvalli, the Bonanno hitman. And it, it was a good one. I really enjoyed that. And, you know, that's why I was like, you know what, Sal, we, I got another guy that'd be cool because Sal was wanting to talk about the whole mafia cops and stuff. And I was like, well, guess what? I got this guy, you know, Michael. So that's how this whole show came about. But um, you know, if anybody wants to check as well in the video description, we got the Sinatra Club playing cards and the Dinner with the Mobster one, uh, the Sinatra Club movie ticket as well. You can also su subscribe to mine and Sal's Patreon channel <laughs> if you want to get more exclusive videos and stuff and be a part of a, you know, exclusive community. But that's pretty much all I got. So, you know, Michael, thank you for coming on. And Sal, you know, thanks again. We oh, Every Sunday we're here, man. <laughs> Good, Good meeting you, Michael. Goodbye. Nice to meet you. Take care. Bye-bye.